Peace, Israel, and Yah bless. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. The title of today's lesson is List Them Mine Enemies, The Enemy Without, Part 1. Once again, this lesson is entitled List Them Mine Enemies, The Enemy Without, Part 1. Once again, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So get ready, brace yourselves, tighten up your jaws, do not turn to the left or to the right, or you will get hit in the mouth. We are to walk the straight and narrow way of the Most High's commandments. Now, last week I did a, a lesson where I pointed out some of the enemies that are within the house of Israel, and I will do a part that pertains to our women. But uh, this week we'll do, a, we'll do this first part, first of two, that pertains to establishing exactly who Israel really is. For in order for us to identify the children of Israel, we must know who they are uh, and what scripture states pertaining to the holy people of the strong one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what we will do, we will go through the scrolls like we normally do to establish Israel, the people, Israel, the nation. And I will do a part two where simply I will list out the enemies of the children of Israel that are without. And we will take that standard. We will take the most highest law and we will put it up against those who claim to be. Well, they actually don't say they're Israelites. They call themselves Israelis, and they call themselves Jews. The children of Israel are not Israelis, nor are they Jews. They are Israelites. However, there are individuals sitting in the land that's claiming to be the sons and daughters of Jacob. And we're going to establish that that's not so. But before that's done, we will address them specifically by taking all of the prophecies and putting it up. The prophecies and the testimony of the Most High and his prophets pertaining to his people. We're going to take all of those testimonies from the Most High's word and from his prophets. And we're going to put it up against these people who are sitting in the land. And we will see we have to bear witness with our own eyes because a witness sees. So we have to be able to look down at the scripture, at the written record of our forefathers <clears throat> and look up with our eyes to what's going on in the land and what's going on around us and we are to bear witness to those words so if we look clearly at what the prophets and the most high stated and those people do not match any of the things that the most high has said then we know clearly it's not them it's not really hard to figure out all right let's begin <clears throat> we will start this lesson list them my enemies the enemy within part one establishing the house of Israel. We will do this with a with 13 questions that I will ask and I will answer, okay, just to establish the house of Israel. I'm going to go through the questions first, and then we're going to go into the book to establish these answers. Question one, who are the chosen people? Question two, who are the sons and daughters of the true and living creator or the true and living God? Question three, who is the son of God? Question four, what are the chosen people chosen to do? Because many people hear the chosen people, the chosen people. Well, if you're chosen, you're chosen to do what? Okay. Uh, who chose them? If you're chosen, who chose you? Six, where are the chosen people? If there were some people that were chosen, it would be an important question to ask, where are they? The seventh question would be, who are or where are they today and who are they? Where are they? Okay. Where are the chosen people? And then the seventh, uh, the seventh question would be, who are they? So we need to establish exactly who are these people and where are these people? Okay. Question eight would be, how can you clearly identify them? So we must be able to identify these people. And scripture clearly identifies the children of Israel and what will befall them. Question nine, why are they or were they cursed? 
Why were the children of Israel, why were they cursed? Question 10, where are they from? These chosen people, where are they from? Question 11, will they ever return? Will they ever return? Question 12, who lives there now? Who, who's currently living in the land that was promised, that was established by the Most High for his people? If you let the Christians tell it, they tell you someone named J.C. died and went up to heaven to establish some place up in the sky for you, some type of pipe dream. The Most High clearly states that the place that he prepared for his people was the land of Canaan, and we know that's on the earth. All right. Uh, and the last question, what does an Israelite look like? Okay, if you're going to have a group of people that's established by bloodline, by genealogy, they're going to have uh, a similar uh, phenotype, okay, for the most part, because they are of a specific bloodline. It's a gene pool of people. It's by genetics, not by belief or by religion. Okay, the house of Israel is established by genealogy, by bloodline. All right, so let's go ahead and establish these 13 questions. I chose specifically 13 because there are 13 tribes in the house of Israel when we consider that Joseph was given a double portion. All right, we will start with question number one. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19 and we'll read verse 3 through verse 6. And question number one, once again, we will establish who are the chosen people. So we need to know exactly who these people are. And we will get some answers in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 through 6. All right. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3 reads, And Moses went up unto Yah, and Yah called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Israel, not to everyone, and tell the children, or to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. The house of Jacob, the children of Israel, same exact entity. The man whose name is Jacob was changed to Israel. It's the same man. So when you hear the house of Jacob or the children of Israel, it is the same exact man, same exact genealogy, same exact gene pool, same exact family. The offspring of Jacob is the offspring of Israel because Israel and Jacob is the same exact man. Verse 4, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and now I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Verse 5, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. And, and holy nation. These are the words which thou shall speak unto the children of Israel. So, the children of Israel are a peculiar people unto the Most High. And they are to be a kingdom of priests unto him. They were chosen to do that specific task. Deuteron let's go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, and we'll read verse 6 through 10. Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Chapter 7. And we'll read verse 6 through 10. All right. Deuteronomy. Chapter 7, verse 6 reads, For thou art an holy people unto Yah thy strength. Yah, thy strength has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, singular, no trinity, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So the house of Israel are a set apart people, a peculiar people, a holy nation of priests that has been set apart above all other people or all other nations upon the face of the earth. This is the most high speaking. Verse 7, Yah did not set his love upon you, nor chose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. 
But because Yah loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath Yah brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 9. Know therefore that Yah thy strength, he is Yah, the faithful strong one, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So those that love the Most High obey his rules. They keep his commandments. Okay, And if they walk in his covenant, he will protect them. He will guide them thousands of generations. And those who refuse to walk within the confines of those laws, he will afflict them. He will kill them. And he will afflict their children. Verse 10. And repayeth them that hate him to their face. If you are walking contrary to the Most High's law, you hate it. You are in direct opposition to it. He's going to repay you to your face. And that means stripes and afflictions. To destroy them, he will not be slack. To him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. So those who hate these laws, statutes, judgments, and precepts, and refuse to hear them, and refuse to do them, or hear them, and yet refuse to obey, the Most High will repay him to his face, and he will be swift in so doing. So we're to re be reminded of that, that we are to walk this straight and narrow way of the Most High's commandments. So we are establishing that first question that the house of Israel are a peculiar, special, set apart, and holy people unto the Most High and the Most High alone. All right. Now, let's jump to that second question. Who is or who are the sons and daughters of the true and living Creator? Or who you may call the true and living God? Now, we will go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. All right. Understanding exactly who the sons and daughters are of the Most High. The sons and daughters of the Most High are the sons and daughters of that man whose name is Jacob that was changed to Israel. And we will establish exactly who the sons and daughters are of the Most High. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we will read verse 15 through 19. And verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 32 reads, But Yeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook Yah which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So Jeshurun is Israel. When our nation became wealthy, that's fat, okay, grown thick, okay, we were able to, <clears throat> to attain wealth and affluence in the midst of these nations or in the midst of the land where we were, uh, we became complacent. We became unmindful. We became <clears throat> uh, totally disrespectful towards the Most High and ungrateful towards His ever-loving kindness and tender mercies that were extended unto us. So once we got rich, we got some money, we got some land, we were established within the land, and we were now the head of all of the nations. We became complacent on exactly who put us there how we got there, and exactly what the criteria was for us to maintain that land and to maintain that position. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. These are idols. With abominations provoke, provoke, provoked they him to anger. So we provoked the most high with nonsense. JC's, JC statues on your neck, JC statue in your house, in your cars, tattooed on your chest, and all this other nonsense, going into these houses of idol worship, stating that it's the house of God. No such thing. 
So we provoke the Most High with all manner of foolishness and abominations that we actually had the stumbling block before our faces and in our hearts. Verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils. All right. Let's establish a few things. A few things here. Devil. A devil is nothing but an idol. If you have a statue sitting up on a wall someplace and you're kissing it, getting down on your knees and worshiping it and doing any nonsense like that, that at that statue is an idol. It's a devil. And if you're worshiping a statue, in essence, you're a devil worshiper. I hope that makes sense to you. And that's direct, straight, in a nutshell. Okay? So we were actually sacrificing unto devils, meaning these are deities, these are idols. These statues that you have on your necks, in your houses, in your churches, and all these other places, <clears throat> they cannot breathe, they cannot see, they cannot smell, they cannot taste, and they surely cannot save. These are dumb idols. Now, verse 17, once again, they sacrifice unto devils, which are idols, not to Yah. These idols that you're worshiping is not the Most High. To God's lowercase idols, whom they knew not. To new gods or new different forms of idols that came newly up. JC is new. We've never heard of it. Whom your fathers feared not. Our fathers feared not a JC. Never heard of them. <clears throat> Absolutely never heard of them. It's new. That's why it's in the New Testament. It is not of old. And we were instructed clearly by the Most High through Moshe that we were not to add or subtract to the Most High's word. So if you have something new you have added, you have transgressed the Most High's law, statutes, judgments, and precepts. And if you are to be mindful that the Most High changes not, there can be nothing new to any of his law, statutes, judgments, and precepts. They have been established from the days of old. So that tells you clearly, if you understand that in its context, that anything new, these newly gods, newly raised up, these idols, these devils, have absolutely nothing to do with the Most High. Verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful. Not only that, we are ungrateful. And has forgotten Yah that formed thee. The Most High formed Israel. Verse 19. <clears throat> And when Yah saw it, he hated them. He abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and his daughters. Now, what that just established in the latter part of verse 19 is that the sons and the daughters of the Most High are the children of Israel, the children of Jacob. Simple as that. So that answers the question, who are the sons and daughters of the living God? Or who are the sons and daughters of Yah? They are the seed line of the man known as Jacob. Or the man whose name was formerly Jacob, but it was changed to Israel. Israel, Jacob, synonymous, same man. His seed are those 12 boys. Those 12 boys make up the house of Israel. They are the sons and daughters of the true and living creator. And no one else. So we have established that. All right, now, <clears throat> question number three, who is the son of God? If you ever want to know who a, man's son's is, who a man's son is or who anyone's child is, the best person for you to ask would to be the person. That's the parent. And they can firmly establish, hey, this is my son and this is not my son. So when we're asking these questions, for the most part, if you just seek the most highest word, He'll answer it for you. Now, the question is, when the Most High gives you an answer via his voice, you have an option of whether you want to hear or forbear. And there's many people that you can take to this verse that I'm about to read and have them read it. And they will see it with their own eyes, hear it with their own ears, and they'll tell you, man, I don't believe that. All right? Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter, let's go... Exodus, Exodus, excuse me, let's go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, and we'll read verse 22, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, 
We're establishing exactly who the Son of the Most High is. That way, once you understand who the Son of the Most High is, it clearly makes shed some light on the question before that. Who are the sons and daughters of the living God? It's very, very simple to understand. All right. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 reads, This is the Most High speaking to Moshe in order for Moshe to go deliver a message specifically from the Most High to the Pharaoh. Verse 22 of Exodus chapter 4 reads, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith Yah. Hmm. Let me repeat that though you understand clearly so you can understand who is actually claiming the house of Israel. This is not some man just saying what he wants to say. This is the most high speaking. Exodus 4, chapter 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, this is the most high talking to Moshe, thus saith Yah, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, <clears throat> I don't care if you have a thousand children and you had 500 twins. Someone came out first. So the most high is stated clear here that Israel is his son and his firstborn. You cannot find JC in here. And that is why when you read Exodus chapter 12, you see clearly the sacrifice that the Most High made on the behalf of his sons and daughters. That's why we have Passover on the 14th day. All right? So someone came into our records and changed it and said someone died for you on the 14th day and rose up and they called that thing Easter Sunday or some madness like that. Roman nonsense. That cannot be established anywhere out of the mouth of any prophet of the Most High. It just cannot be. So we understand clearly that the Most High said Israel is his son. That reiterates whom the sons and daughters of the Most High, who they are, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 15 through 19, that we are the sons and daughters of the true and living creator. And he killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, via the Passover because the Pharaoh and the Egyptians were holding his firstborn, were holding his sons and daughters. Well, you want to hold my sons and daughters, let them go that they may serve me because the house of Israel, we are the servants of the Most High. We are the apple of the Most, of the, the eye of the Most High. We are the people to bring forth his praise. You understand? So therefore, we are a special people unto him. So the Most High was telling the Pharaoh, look, you're holding my sons and daughters. You need to let them go that they may serve me. And if you do not let them go, if you refuse, I'm going to kill your children because you're holding my children. Very simple, very simple and to the point explanation. And that's why they were killed. But someone told you, someone named JC died on your behalf. You cannot find that in Exodus chapter 12. I dare you to find it. It does not exist. Now, to the fourth question. <clears throat> the fourth question of the 13, the fourth question reads, what are the chosen people chosen to do? Let's go into the record and see exactly why the house of Israel was chosen and for what reason. Let's go to Exodus. Once again, we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, and we'll read verse 6. And verse 6 of Exodus chapter 19 reads, <clears throat> And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Not everybody. Now, we are to be a nation of priests. We are to be a holy people. For the Most High is holy, and he has chosen us un unto himself. We cannot walk with the Most High unless we are in accordance with him, or unless we are in agreement with him. Therefore, if he is holy, we have to be holy. And if we're anything other than holy, he will separate himself from us. Therefore, we are no longer under his protection, and that's how we get all these stripes 
This is how we get all these problems when we decide to walk our own way. So we understand we are a priest, a, a nation of priests. Now, being a nation of priests means that we are to teach these nations the most high's law. Now, if you look in the midst of these nations nowadays, you will see clearly that they are lawless. Hence, we have all these problems throughout the earth. Now, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 25. Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 25. That where we will establish, you know, what are these chosen people chosen to do? Isaiah 45, and we will read verse 25. Verse 25 of Isaiah chapter 45 reads, In Yah shall all the seed of Israel be blessed, or be justified, and shall glory. Once again, Isaiah 45 Verse 25 reads, In Yah shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. We are the glory of the Most High. We are the people to bring forth His praise, meaning we are to take all of these law, statutes, judgments, and precepts, and the job that we were chosen to do was to bring forth His light, bring forth His righteousness, Bring forth his covenant. Bring forth his law to these nations. That is our job. And that's why we were chosen. Now, Isaiah chapter 66, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 60. And we will read verse 6 through 9. Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. And we will read verse 6 through 9. And verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 60. That may not be the chapter that I need. Hang on. All right. That is indeed the chapter that I was looking for. Our end of verse. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6 through 9. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6 reads, The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The room there is of Midian and Ephah, all they from Seba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praise of Yah. Verse 7. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. This is the house of Israel. Verse 8, who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves to their windows? Verse 9, surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring my sons from far, their silver and their gold with them. <clears throat> Unto the name of Yah thy strength and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So the house of Israel will be established and we will be glorified in the midst of all these nations. We will magnify the most high's law, make it honorable and give glory unto his holy name. So we are going to be established in the midst of all of these nations because we are going to bring forth the most high's praise. So this is the job that we were chosen to do. Isaiah 59 Verse 21. Let's turn to Isaiah 59. <clears throat> Isaiah 59, verse 21. In Isaiah 59, verse 21 reads, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith Yah, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, your children, your offspring, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, your children's children, that's your grandchildren, saith Yah, 
from henceforth and forever. So we are to establish the Most High's word, his covenant. We're to teach it and we're to do it within our families. And we are also to teach it and to magnify it throughout the entire earth. This is our job. Now let's turn to Isaiah 43, verse 19 through 21. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19 through verse 21. And verse 19 of Isaiah chapter 43 reads, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Verse 20. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I gave water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. These are the things that the Most High did while we were in the wilderness. His people, his chosen, Israel. Verse 21. This people, Israel, have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Showing forth the praise of the Most High is magnifying his law and making it honorable and giving glory unto his holy name. We will show forth his praise when we lift up the standard of his law, meaning we're not accepting of homosexuality. We're not accepting of liars. We're not accepting of men stealing. We're not accepting of men murdering someone, cheating them. Things that are like all the things that are contrary to this law. We will not partake in it, nor will we be parties to it or any other manner of wickedness that we were instructed clearly not to do. And this is how we show forth the most highest praise by walking within his covenant. And that is our righteousness for our righteousness is of him via the extension of his mercy which is his law. All right. So that covers some of the points that I wanted to answer on question number four. Uh, <clears throat> on exactly what the chosen, what are the chosen people chosen to do? We're to bring forth the praise of the Most High. We're to magnify his law, make it honorable, uh, and giving glory unto his holy name, and teaching these nations his law. So therefore, we're not to be cussing them out doing all of these things. We are to bring forth the light. We are the light bearers, and the light is that law. We are to teach it to Israel first, because if Israel does not fix himself, if we do not fix ourselves, then the earth cannot be fixed. The first thing we must do, we are the leaders of the earth. We are the ones to bring forth the most highest praise, to bring forth his light to the Gentiles. And the only way the way we can do that is we must first fix ourselves by returning back onto the Most High's law, acknowledging our faults, and then he will restore us on high that we, that we may then set things in order by teaching the nations his law. That is why in Isaiah chapter 2, when all the nations say, come and let us go up to the mountain of Yah, that he may teach us his ways, that's his law. So when these nations come, as I've discussed in videos past, stating that your enemies are coming. All those that have hated this word and hated you in times past, they have to come to you so they can learn this law. So when these nations come up, when the man grab a hold of you that is from another nation and say, I am with you for the most high is with you. He wants to know exactly what do I need to do to save myself and my house. And that's when you will teach him and instruct him in the ways of the Most High's law. So we are to know this because we are to teach it. And a man cannot teach that which he does not know. That is why it's imperative that we teach this law. Touching on that, as it pertains to teaching this law, what we're not to do, we cannot be discouraged when we see that our people are not taking a hold of this law like we would like them to, are abstinent 
this recalcitrant will not listen, simply are in opposition to it. What we cannot do, we cannot at any time see someone involved in wickedness and figure, you know what, he's wicked anyway. There's nothing that I'm going to say that may have an impact on him. I'll just leave him or her to his or her own devices. If we were to take such a stance, then the wicked will never have a chance because there's no one to tell him that his way is incorrect and his way is the way of destruction. So it takes to teach this word to our people. It takes someone who actually cares about the most high and cares about the most high's word. That's one. Next, it takes someone who cares and have a love for his own people. Because if you do not have a love for your own people or love for people in general, you cannot do this job because you have to teach it to those who may not even want to hear it. But what you cannot do, you cannot figure, you know what, he's not going to listen anywhere. I'm not going to tell him. I'm just, I'm just going to sit back and watch this man uh, die in his own sin. And that would be a sin in itself for the righteous. So our job is to ensure that we continue to put the most highest law before them and let them be given a chance to make a choice because some people are doing things in error and walking contrary to the most highest law but truth be told many of them have never heard of this law they do not know exactly what the criteria and how they are to conduct themselves they have been caught up in JC for 30 40 years so sometimes it is not a direct belligerent refusal to do the law sometimes is just the fact that they've never been told and they're ignorant of it and it's never been exposed to them and no one taught it to them and no one showed it to them so we cannot just leave them to their own devices when we see that they're going in the wrong way that will be irresponsible and it's an unrighteous thing to do as we see clearly Ezekiel was instructed that, hey, look, if you don't tell this man about his wicked way, then I'm going to hold you accountable for that. So that is our job. We are not to see the house of Israel going in the wrong direction and figure, you know what, we'll just let him go that way and fall off a cliff. Irresponsible, and it shows no love and no care for your people or for the Most High. For the Most High does not have any pleasure in seeing his people being destroyed. That's why we have prophets. That's why we have men raising up in all of these nations teaching this law. That's why we have this book here. Because the law is an extension of the Most High's mercy. So if he had enough love and extended the mercy of his law to me that I may be able to understand it and do it then certainly I should have it within my heart to be able to teach this to our people with the same ever-loving kindness that they also may see what I have seen and change their ways and that is someone who is compassionate about his people and that may want to do right and teach that which is right without doing it for profit all right. Now we're going to look at uh, the fifth question. The fifth question pertaining to this. Let me make sure that I have covered all that I wanted to cover pertaining to that. Uh, we are actually Isaiah 43. All right. Let's go ahead and read Isaiah 43 and we will read. Let's read verse 7. We're still at the, uh, the fifth question. Okay. And the fifth question, once again, as a reminder, okay, who, who chose them? Who chose these people of Israel? Okay. All right. Question number five. Who chose the people of Israel? Or who chose them? Uh, let's read Isaiah 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, verse 7 reads, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. That's Israel. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. This is the Most High speaking to the children of Israel. Now, let's jump to jump back to the very first verse of Isaiah chapter 43. We're establishing, we're establishing exactly these chosen people known as Israel. Who chose them? Who was the one that told you that you're chosen? And that's what we're establishing here at question number five. Now, Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1 reads, but now, thus saith Yah, 
that created thee. O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Jacob, Israel, synonymous. So we understand clearly now who created Jacob, who created Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So we understand clearly here that the Most High is the one that created Israel. Okay, the Most High is the one that redeemed Israel, not JC. He redeemed us when he killed all of those Egyptians, okay? And that we are his. Okay, so we were chosen by the Most High, not by Joe Schmuck. Okay, now, <clears throat> let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Going back to chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we will read verse 6. And verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 7 again reads, For thou art an holy people unto Yah thy strength. Yah thy strength has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So we are establishing here that who chose these people called Israel? Who chose this nation called Israel? Whose decision was this to choose these people for this specific task? And the answer is Yah. He is the one that made that choice. All right. Question six. Where are the chosen people? Okay, where are they? Where are these chosen people? So let's answer question six. Where are the chosen people? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter four, and we'll read verse 27. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 27 reads, And Yah shall scatter you among the nations. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen. That's the nations. Whither Yah shall lead you. So, when we start asking the question, where or, or you know, where are these chosen people? Where are they at? Where are the chosen? We know good and well. Well, if you want to know where they are, these chosen people are scattered in the midst of the nations. How do we know this? Because the Most High makes it plain that he scattered them. Now, let's turn to Ezekiel ch chapter 22, verse 15. Ezekiel chapter 22, and we will read verse 15. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 15 reads, And I will scatter them among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. So, the house of Israel was scattered into the midst of the nations, and the purpose for that was to pretty much to purge out the rebels. So, when you're seeing many of us getting our heads busted in these many nations, it's the Most High purging out the children of Israel in the midst of the nations. He's removing the filth. He's removing the dross. You figure if you bust enough heads, maybe some of us will wisen up to what's happening and why. So many times when you see us being gunned down in the streets and everything else, the Most High repaying us to our face. The only thing is some of us are not able to see, to hear, and to understand what is happening in the midst of us, in the midst of the nations, and in the midst of our people. Now, let's turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 19. Ezekiel chapter 36, and we will read verse 19. And verse 19 reads, And I scattered them among the heathen. We're already here. And they have dispersed and they were, excuse me, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. According to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. So, when you see the Most High breaking us off in the midst of these nations, 
is the most high repaying us to our faces in the midst of these nations. Sometimes when a man is looking at a thing, he can see it, but he doesn't know what it is. He can't identify it. That's what happened to the house of Israel because our knowledge was removed. Our names were removed. Everything was removed. We were made blind. We were made deaf. And our hearts were made fat. That way we were not able to understand. We were given a confusion of face. So this is why when we see these things, things happening in 2020, you will have an Israelite come up and say, I can't believe this is happening in 2020. Shame of face. Total confusion. Total anger. Lack of understanding for why these things are befalling him. Fire is all around Jacob. He's being consumed by it. But he has no idea why he's being burnt. So the Most High is judging us based on our own ways in our own doings. So therefore, if we were to make our ways and our doings good, then we will be judged in a way that is good. Or favorable would be the best term for that. But as we continue to walk in opposition to this law, stripes and afflictions are coming aplenty. So we understand clearly why we're going through what we're going through. Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we'll read verse 26. And Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 26 reads, I said, I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. So all the nations have no idea who the children of Israel are. The children of Israel has no idea who they are because their memories were removed. Their heritage was removed and they were scattered throughout the nations. And they now are wearing the names of their enemies, speaking the languages of their enemies, practicing the customs of their enemies, and serving the idols, a.k.a. gods of their enemies. Confused, shame of face, bottom of the barrel, stripes and affliction are plenty, and they have no idea why this is happening. Now, so that simply addresses what happened to these people called Israel. They were scattered in all these many different things befalled them. All right, now, question seven. Who are they today? These Israelites, who are they? All right, the children of Israel today are those of the diaspora. When we were shipped away, taken away from Israel, ran down into the many nations of Africa. <clears throat> Keep in mind, Israel is in Northeast Africa. As we came down into those many lands, we all may look alike, but there are very distinctive characteristics, different phenotypes, and different traditions and customs in the midst of many different people. So all quote-unquote black people are not the same. We don't look the same, and we certainly aren't built the same, and certainly our customs are not the same. So when the house of Israel came down into what you would call the bigger body of Africa, okay, those are people that look just like them. The only thing is there are difference in their ways and their customs, and certainly they were serving different quote-unquote gods. The house of Israel, we know good and well our strong one was the strong one of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the nations in the midst of us were not, that's not who they were serving. They were serving something totally different. And we were instructed not to ever fall in their ways. All right? So if you are of the diaspora, you know good and well that your family was shipped from someplace else. You're in a strange land. You're speaking Spanish. You're speaking French. You're speaking English. You have an English name on you. You have a Dutch name on you. You have a French name on you. All right? You have a Spanish name on you. And you know you've got an English name, but you're not an Englishman. You look like me. You've got a Dutch name, but you're not a Dutchman. You look like me. 
All right, you got a Spanish name, but you're not a Spaniard. You look like me. All right. We are the people that was scattered throughout the many nations of the earth. <clears throat> Our names were removed. That's why we have English names if we're in the English speaking countries. And that's why we speak English. And if you're in the Spanish countries, you speak Spanish and you have a Spanish name. And if you're from one of the former Dutch colonies, you have a Dutch name, <clears throat> etc., etc. So we were taken away from our lands, stripped of our names, stripped of our heritage, stripped of our identities, stripped of our knowledge of who the Most High is, stripped of the knowledge of who we are, and hence we are sitting in the midst of these nations, lost, confused, and misled. And all of this is by design. So that's who the children of Israel are. We are here in the diaspora, confused, shipped away through slavery. And the Most High punishes the children of Israel when we disobeyed him. The punishment was to be shipped out of the land. And since we did not want to serve the Most High and we wanted to be like other wicked nations, we were sent to those that we idolized. We were sent to those that we wanted to be like. So now we chose wickedness. We are in the midst of wicked people being dealt with in a wicked manner and we want to complain. Let me say that again. We chose wickedness. We wanted to be like wicked people. We had righteousness. We had righteous law. We had righteous judges. We had righteous judgment. We had a righteous king, the most high. We wanted a regular man to be king, i.e. Saul. We wanted to be like the other nations who were wicked. So we chose wickedness, stepped away from righteousness. We were shipped to wicked people because we chose wickedness. And when we're being dealt with in a wicked, cruel manner, we are complaining. Can you imagine that? Once again, that is to bring it to you in regular English so you can understand. There are times when a man may look at a thing and yet not understand that which he sees. And by me speaking to you in normal English like this, you can clearly get a better understanding of what it is you're looking at when you see it. Because you have to see it. The Most High said, Israel is my witness and a witness sees. So these words are or for you to bear witness to in your lifetime as you begin to be awakened when the Most High puts His Spirit on you. And that's how you begin to really acknowledge and understand exactly what is really going on. And then you have an opportunity to kind of turn back or continue to go off a cliff. That becomes a choice that each and every one will have to make. Now, who are the children of Israel today? The children of Israel today can be identified clearly if you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Most High laid out specifically what curses that he would place upon the children of Israel. And if you can read those curses, I'm not going to go over it in this segment, in this lesson. When I do the part two, I'm going to go over it. Okay, but if we were to read those curses, starting from verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will see all the curses the Most High put on the children of Israel when he scattered them to the four corners of the earth. Now, when you look in the many nations, when you see the people that have different names, where the names of their enemies are following lockstep in their enemies' ways and customs, are totally confused, are at the bottom of the barrel, are victimized, etc., etc., all those curses listed out, that's how you can clearly identify who the children of Israel are. And if you don't match those curses, you're not the children of Israel. It's really that simple. All right. Now. So Deuteronomy 28 would be what you can read from verse 15 all the way through so you can understand exactly what the Most High did to the children of Israel. And when you read those curses, all you have to do is look around your city, look around the country that you live in, look across the earth and see the people that matches those curses or that criteria for those curses. And there you have it. That's the children of Israel staring you in the face. Now. Let's read Isaiah chapter 6, and we will read verse 9 through 12. Isaiah chapter 6, 
verse 9 through 12. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 through 12, and verse 9 reads, And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Once again, a man can look at a thing, I see it, but I don't know what I'm looking at. Verse 10, Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and convert, and be healed. In other words, keep them confused. Most of them take away our ability to understand. Now, if a man cannot see, and a man cannot hear, those who are lacking sight, and lacking hearing, are referred to as dumb. So the blind and dumb are affectionately known, affectionately known as dummies. So what we are, we are dummies in the midst of the nations. We cannot perceive. Okay? Verse 11. <clears throat> then said I, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. So Isaiah wanted to know how long are you going to keep us walking around dumb in these nations? How long will we be in these nations walking around not knowing who we are, where we're from, who our strong one is, etc.? And he said he was going to have this thing happen until there was none of us in the land that we would be rooted out. All right. Verse 12. And Yah have removed men far away that there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. All right, great forsaking in the midst of the land. This means there will be no law in there, nothing but absolute wickedness, destruction, and everything that's not good. All right? So that this, this is the importance to why we should be in the Most High's law. Okay? So he was going to remove us out of the land, and there will be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. So we are to understand clearly that when we were made blind, and that's part of the curses of the children of Israel, they will be in the land totally confused about some things that's very simple for them to see. Or you would think it would be a simple thing for them to see and understand and perceive, but they still cannot because their knowledge, wisdom, and understanding has been removed from them. All right, let's go to nine, because seven and eight pretty much encompasses each other. So we will go to the question number nine. Why were they or why are they cursed? So we established clearly that the children of Israel would be a cursed people. Once we have read Deuteronomy chapter 28, they would be cursed and they would be scattered throughout the land. So why were they cursed? Why were they scattered? Let's establish that. Uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27 and we'll read verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 26 reads, Cursed be he, that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Blessed be the name of Yah. This amen thing right here that you see in this book, this refers to the Egyptian god Ra. This has nothing to do with the Most High. So we have to be able to go into this book, read it, and discern exactly what's in it. All right? So, the Most High is stating here that any man that does not confirm this law, the words of it, and don't do it, he's a cursed man. So any Israelite that received this law and decided he was going to walk contrary to it, that man was cursed from then on. And anyone that hears it now is cursed as well. Now, for those of you who are in this law, the importance of this, of this law, is to me... It's very important, uh, and it's telling because if you let 
the Romans tell it, if you let the Christians tell it, uh, but hey, this, uh, the law cannot be done by any man. So when you decide to pick up this mantle to teach our people and to walk within this law, you're doing a few things. One, you're magnifying the most highest law. You're making it honorable. People are looking at you. They're beginning to look and see exactly how a man or a woman is supposed to carry themselves that's walking within that law. You are the living and the breathing example that the law can be followed. You're also a living and breathing example that the law is to be followed. That it is to be followed, that it can be followed, and that there are rewards in doing so. And those who are not in it, they will be feeling all the ramifications and the punishments for not walking within it. So when you're shining that light, there are those who may gravitate to that light that has been in darkness that are tired of that darkness. But at the same time, there are those who have been accustomed to darkness. Darkness is akin to sin. Darkness is akin to wickedness. So therefore, when you shine that light, they're going to run the other way because that which you're speaking is right and righteous. And that is not their mindset. That is not their mind state. And that is not their intent to do that which is right. So therefore, they will go in opposition to you. You go to the left, they're going to the right. OK, so understand that there's a great role to be played by those of us who are teaching this law. And even if you don't have a YouTube channel and you're not teaching it in the manner in which I'm doing it like this, then the fact that you're doing it each and every day, people are seeing how you carry yourself, how you speak, how you dress, your mannerisms, your actions, your decisions, all of these things. Anything that you do, someone is watching. So therefore, you are magnifying the law in that regard, even if you're not having a YouTube channel teaching it in this regard. And I encourage you to teach it because your delivery may be better than mine. Your reading might be better than mine. Your understanding may be better than mine. And you may be able to reach more people than I can. OK, so the goal is for all of us to pick up this mantle and to teach this word. But do not be as Brother Nick Cannon. Do not speak the truth and not live it. Do not speak it and not walk it. There's ramifications for that. Also, let me add this. For those of us who are in this law that has turned back from wickedness and have discovered, have come across, have sought out the most highest righteousness and have made the decision to walk within it. If you make the error of doing that and then reverting back to your old ways, being a party to wickedness and doing things that are contrary to that which you know is right, then the punishments will be magnified upon you. So once you start to walk this road, there is no turning back. There is no turning to the left and there's no turning to the right. It is straight ahead because if not, you're going to get your head busted in the worst way because you know many are doing wrong and have no clue. It's a different thing when a man does wrong and he knows what's right. It's going to the most high will come down hard, hard on you for that. So be mindful of those things. And that is why it's important that we must read this book every day. We're not to make the assumption of, you know what, man, I already know that. I already read that. I already know the law. I'm not going to read today. Try to read a chapter every day. Read a page every day. I don't care if it's just a little bit. It's to re reinforce in your mind, reinforce in your heart, reinforce in your spirit that you are to do that which is right. For if you decide, if you decide to stop not reading, stop reading and, and shift away from it, you may find that your mind and your actions may revert back to thinking and doing some of the things you did or used to do in times past, and that will not go well for you. So I encourage you to ensure that you read this book every day is to keep you immersed in the Most High's Law. It's an anchor. It keeps you grounded. So be mindful of that. All right. Now let's go ahead and uh, where were we? Uh, we just finished reading uh, Deuteronomy chapter 27. And we read verse 26. <clears throat> All right, let me see one second.
Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse... One second, let me get to where we were. All right. We were at uh, the ninth question. Why were the people cursed? Okay, why, why is the house of Israel cursed? So we read clearly that if they're walking contrary to the law, we would know clearly that they would be cursed. Any man of Israel who chose not to walk in this law, he would be cursed. So the curses came upon us when we chose not to walk in the way that is right. Okay? Now, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's read verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. That way we understand clearly why were these people, why were the people cursed? Why were the sons and daughters of Jacob cursed? Why were the sons of Israel cursed? Why were the sons and daughters of the Most High, the living Creator, why were they cursed? Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we will read verse 15. And verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 28 reads, But it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken, will not listen, unto the voice of Yahweh's strength, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So, the reason for the curses and why they were placed upon us is because we chose not to hearken to the voice of the Most High, not to hearken to the instruction that he had given us via his prophets. All right? So, this is why we were cursed. That is to establish that. All right. The tenth question is, where are these people from? Where are Israel from? All right. The house of Israel were given the land of Canaan. Okay. Now, keep in mind where modern day Israel is. This is Northeast Africa. Okay. The inhabitants of those lands look like what you would call Africans today. So what you would have is one set of dark people dark you people like myself going into the land of some other dark you people. So we are not to be confused in thinking that all the people that look like I look are the same. And keep in mind, when you go into the book of Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 10, and you see the list of all the nations, there's no such thing as a nation of black people in there. Okay? There's no need for you to call a man a black man when you look around and all of them will look like this. <clears throat> okay? This term came into being with Europeans. All right? So when all of us looked the same, we were identified by our tribes and we were identified by our nations. No one was identified, identified by something that we call race. It's a new construct of the European. Because all the lands that the European nations conquered and enslaved these Romans and the rest of them, when they conquered those lands, as people that look like us that lived there. Just so you understand that. Because he's, he's Johnny, Johnny New on the block. So when he goes to the Pacific Island and all these other different places, it's people that look like us. And keep in mind that our people come with different shades of hue. And we come with different textures of hair. Okay? So, a quote-unquote what we refer to as a black person comes in many different variations. Through the Pacific Island, from Fiji to Papua New Guinea, all these different places. Down in the Philippines with the Negritos, etc., etc., we are different types of people, okay? And when the European was conquering all these many different lands, we were the people he was conquering. That's why it was important that he presented to you a God that looked like him. Is that way you would not be in opposition to his rule. We are to understand that. And that's the simple answer for question 10. All right, let's go to 11. Question 11, and the 11th question was, will they ever return? We know good and well that the house of Israel has been scattered. So now the question would be, well, we 
we're going to look and identify the children of Israel. And the next question we want to know is, well, they were scattered and kicked out of the land. Will they ever return? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Will they ever return? And that will be question 11. And the answer to that question is, yes, the house of Israel will return. But let's look at what the criteria is for that to take place. Deuteronomy chapter 32, we'll read verse 1 through 3. Will they ever return? Will these children of Israel ever be returned back onto the land that was promised unto them after they were kicked out for disobedience and walking in their own way? All right. Once again, we're looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, we will read verse 1 through verse 3. And Deuteronomy chapter 32, one second, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 through 3, <clears throat> and verse 1 reads, excuse me, all right, correction, correction, not Deuteronomy chapter 32, we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Uh, this answers the question, question number 10, uh, will they return back onto this land that they were kicked out of? And the answer to that and the criteria for their return is in Deuteronomy chapter 30, not De De Deuteronomy chapter 32. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we will read verse 1 through 3. And verse 1 reads, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nation whither Yah thy strength has driven thee. So, once we received the blessings, and then we got all these curses, and then we got kicked out of the land, and then the Most High pours out his Spirit upon us, brings us to remembrance when we go into the book of remembrance and read it, and we're giving a spirit of discernment to understand it. He said, then we're going to start bringing all these things to mind. We're going to start recollecting exactly what has happened to us and what has happened to our people. We're going to be talking to our parents, talking to our grandparents, looking up the history books, putting up the old news from the 60s, from the 40s and the 30s, and looking at what took place in the nation that we live in and look at what's taking place and what took place in the nations where we have been scattered. And we will be able to put together a collage put together an understanding of exactly what has happened to our people and understand clearly that we are the same people who have had the same problems befall them. The internet is a wonderful thing. All right. Verse 2. And shall return unto Yah thy strength and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. So what is, what is going to happen is we're going to be in these lands after we've been scattered and we've been cursed and beat up on, etc. And then what we're going to do, we're going to return back onto the Most High. And the only way we do that is we turn back to this law. That's why you're here at this channel hearing all of this. So as we make this return back onto the Most High and do that which he commanded us at the first when we turn and our children turn and we do this turning about to this law, grabbing a hold of it with our, with our whole heart and our whole soul, let's see what happens after we do that. Verse 3, that then, Yah thy strong one will turn thy captivity. He's going to turn our circumstances around and have compassion upon thee. Right now, there's no compassion. We're getting our heads busted. And will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Yah thy strong one hath scattered thee. So, in all the many nations where we have been scattered, and we read that these children of Israel, the children of Jacob, the sons and daughters of the living creator, he scattered his people throughout the earth. Once we return back unto his law that he instructed us at the first, and we drop the ways and the customs of the heathen of the many nations in which we have been scattered, and us and our children turn with our whole heart and our whole soul back onto his instruction. He said, then, and only then, will he turn our circumstances around. And then will he have compassion upon us. And then will he return. And then will he gather us 
out of these many nations where he has scattered us. And then he will plant us back into the land that he promised unto our forefathers. And then he will take all the many curses that he had placed upon us and he will place it upon our enemies. Now you know why they don't want you to read this book of remembrance. Because once you begin to turn back onto the most high's laws, statutes, judgments, and precepts, like you were commanded at the first, they are done. Finished. You're to be mindful of that. So if you don't like what's happening to you right now, and you don't like what's happening to your people right now, Teach them this law, magnify this law, make it honorable in doing it, teaching it, and give glory unto the Most High. And that's going to help speed up this turnaround process. So if you can't stand what's happening right now, the correct position is not going to be, well, I understand the Most High's law, statutes, judgments, and precepts. I'm doing it. I'm not going to teach that Israelite right there. I'm not going to show him. I'm not going to, because he don't want to hear it anyway. So I'm not going to tell him. So if we're tired of this thing, we have got the out. But we have to go to work. We have to learn it. We have to know it. Because you cannot teach that which you do not know. And this is our job for us to correct things within the earth. Because we are the priest of the earth, which is a great responsibility. Okay? So we understand clearly here that we are to turn, and once we turn back from all of this wickedness, that then the Most High is going to have compassion upon us. So, yes, we will return. All right? Ezekiel chapter 12, and we will read verse 14 through 17. Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel chapter 12, and we will read verse 14 through verse 17. All right. And verse 14 of Ezekiel chapter 12 reads, And I will scatter towards every wind all that are about him to help him and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them. And they shall know that I am Yah when I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. So you understand clearly who brought you to these lands. Who brought you to Central America, Latin America, South America, the Caribbean, and the Americas? If, if you let us tell it in the man version, it's the European that's done it. And those Jews are responsible for the scattering of our people. Okay? So is the European, because they're all, and so is the Arab. They're all in cahoots together against the children of Israel. So we understand clearly why we were scattered, okay? And the most, and we understand who scattered us. We were scattered by the Most High. It is Him who did this. Verse sixteen. But I will leave a few of a few men of them from the sword. He's going to save a few of us from the famine and from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, whether they come, and they shall know that I am Yah. So it is going to be a few of us left. And we're going to declare all the foul things that we have done among the heathen. Doing it right now. Okay. We know good and well. I'm declaring to the house of Israel all the mess that we have done in the midst of these heathen. And reminding you of the Most High's covenant that we are to turn to it and do that which is right in the sight of the Most High. Okay. So we shall know clearly exactly, you know, that we are not to do any of this madness among the heathen where the Most High has scattered us. We're actually going to declare that we are the children of Israel. We're going to bring forth this message and many of them will not like it. Many of them are going to be upset by it because as we give this report, it's going to be a vexation unto them. They're going to be angry by it. But what they cannot do, they cannot say, hey, let me go into the scripture let me go into the scrolls. Let me go into the words of the Most High and show you that that's not so. They do not want to have that conversation and they will never have that conversation. When we present this law to you, when we present this evidence to you, we're going with thus saith Yah. 
and no voice, no authority, no man, nothing trumps the words of the Most High. And no one changes it and no one trumps it. So when we come to you with thus saith Yah, we don't want to hear thus saith Peter, Paul, Andrew, Matthew, or any of these other Europeans who are not prophets. These are liars. We've discussed this before. All right. Let's look at uh, the 12th question. The 12th question, who lives there now? Who is currently living in the land of Israel? And we're going to discuss in part two all that's taking place there and exactly who's in there and exactly who's running this land. All right. If we look at 2 Kings, 2 Kings, we'll look at 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 17. All right. 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's read verse 18. We'll probably read 18 through 24. Okay. Uh, 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17, and we'll read verse 18 through 24. 2 Kings 17, 18 through 24. All right. 23 in this verse. 20. All right. Therefore, Yah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. Israel. His sons and his daughters is who he removed out of his sight, scattered them in the midst of the many nations. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So everyone was shipped out, but Judah was left before he was kicked out. All right, the whole tribe. Verse 19, also, Judah kept not the commandments of Yah their strength, but walked in the statues of Israel, which they made. All right, now, let's look at this. You're dealing with... Israel, the northern part known as Ephraim and known as Samaria. All right. And then you have Judah, who's down in the south. So what you have are two nations, one whole nation called Israel split. Lower half, the south, known as Judah, also known as Zion. OK. And you have the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is known as Ephraim. It's known as Samaria. It's also known as Israel. So Ephraim, Samaria, Israel, the northern, the northern part of Israel, they're all shipped away. And all that's remaining is Judah in the south. But Judah was doing the same foulness, the same foul things that they were doing in the northern kingdom. So he was also, the house of Judah was also shipped out. And Judah is the lawgiver of the Most High. Okay? So, as it reads here in verse 19, also Judah kept not the commandments of Yah their strength, but walked in the statutes of Israel. So the southern king kingdom did the same abominations as the, as the northern kingdom, and that's why they got kicked out also. Verse 12, and Yah rejected all the seed of Israel. Once again, there's a man named Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. This man, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, had 12 sons. His 12 sons and their children, all of them sons and daughters, are what is referred to as the children of Israel, the sons and daughters of Israel, the sons and daughters of Jacob, the sons and daughters of the living creator. Okay? So, the Most High rejected all his seed. He took every last one of them. Ephraim, all of them kicked him out. Judah kicked him out. Zebulun kicked him out. Levi kicked the whole tribe, the whole family's removed. So he rejected all the seed of Israel, kicked them out of his land, and afflicted them. And we're seeing that affliction every day. And delivered them into the hand of spoilers. People are robbing you left and right, not showing you any justice, not showing you any equity. All right? Until he had cast them out of his sight. Yeah, that's why we're here speaking English in America and all the other English-speaking nations and speaking Spanish in the Spanish-speaking nations and speaking Dutch and speaking French and being in the midst of our enemies, people who actually hate us. And many of us want to turn a blind eye and act like this is not really happening. 
So many of us are playing stupid in these nations. All right. Verse 21. For he rent Israel from the house of David. Okay. The whole nation of Israel was ruled by one captain of the people, ruled by one governor of the people. You incorrectly call him a king. David is not a king, neither was Saul. These were men anointed by the Most High to be captains of his people. These were governors. So what happened, the Most High rent, he tore the kingdom from the house of David because the house of David were to be rulers over the people, the whole entire 12 tribes. So he tore it away from the house of David because Solomon chose to walk astray by marrying strange wives and building altars onto the idols or the gods of these many strange women. All right. So verse 21, once again, the most high rent the house of Israel from David, took it from him. Okay. And then he gave it to Jeroboam, his servant, the son of Nebat. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following Yah and made them sin a great sin. So the kingdom is now split in two. You have the northern kingdom. That's Jeroboam is running. And you still have the establishment of David's house down in the south. So Jeroboam was like, you know what? I don't want the people of the north going down to the most highest house to worship the most high down there in Judah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build me some houses up here. I'm going to build me some calves up here. I'm going to build me some abominations up here. That way the people would stay up here with me and do wrong. So he caused the whole house of Israel to sin. All right. Verse 22. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. So they continued. We continued to walk after the abominations of Jeroboam. And thus, the people of Ephraim, the people of Samaria, the people of the north, Israel, they were separated from the people of the south. Okay, because the Most High only had one house in one place. And regardless of where you are in those many lands, you had to go to that one house. You had to travel there. Most High has never had a house in your city. Never. Never had one in North America, South America, Latin America, the Caribbean, China, Europe, any of those places. One house. And when that third house is built and established, those nations that are allowed to live will have to send representatives up there once each and every year. All right, so let that be established. Now let's go ahead and move down to uh, verse 22. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they departed not from them. Verse 23. Until Yah removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. The servants were telling us, the prophets were telling us, hey, Straighten up your act. Turn back to the Most High. But we didn't want to, so since we didn't, we got the repercussions of that. Okay? So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. So you still have men of the house of Israel in Assyria to this very day. You go in Iraq, and if you go in Iran, there are men who look just like me. That's being treated foul, left and right. These men are men of Israel. Now, verse 24, the last verse. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Qatar, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and, some, and from Shepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they, pro and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So we have Babylonians in the land and men from all kind of weird nations in this land. So what you have when you look at the land of Israel right now, you have Edomites in the land, you have Babylonians in the land, and a whole bunch of other people in the land that were brought from other places after the children of Israel were shipped out. So what we have in the midst of the land right now is wickedness, 
violence in a mixed multitude of nations. And that's putting it in a nutshell. And we're going to cover more of that when we do part two. All right. Last question of the 13 is, <clears throat> what does an Israelite look like? Obviously, if you have one man whose name is Israel and he had some sons, they would share some genetic characteristics of their father. They will look like him. Okay. So let's get a general understanding of what this house of Israel would look like. And we have text, we have scrolls that can help us discern this and get a feel for it. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 19. Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, verse 19. All right, Exodus chapter 2, verse 19, and it reads, And they said, this is the daughter of Ruel, okay, the Midianite. And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. Okay, so the daughters of Ruel came up with their sheep. There is Moshe. So he moved the rock, allowed the sheep to get water, fill up their vessels with water, etc., etc. So they got back to their father, Ruel, and Ruel is asking them, Hey, how were you able to draw water, give water to the animals, and be back so quickly today? And they said, well, there was this Egyptian that was there, and he delivered us, kind of got us ahead of the rest of the shepherds, got us this water, and, was, and we were able to feed the flock and be in and out of there quickly. And that's why we were able to come back so soon today. All right, so they identified Moshe as an Egyptian. Now, let's keep this in mind. Egypt, biblical name is Misraim. These are sons of Canaan. When you look at the lands in that Canaan occupied, it's all those lands throughout Africa. So when you think of Canaanites, these are dark-hued people. Look similar to me. Different customs, different ways, similar in appearance. So an Egyptian and an Israelite side by side you're not able to tell to say, you know what, that's the Egyptian and that's not. Very difficult to tell. Okay? So keep in mind, Moses lived in the house of Pharaoh until he was 40. All right? So literally, Moses is Pharaoh's grandson, literally. All right? Uh, and he was able to maneuver and do all the things he needed to do. He looked like him. And when you look into any of the, you look into any of those hieroglyphs in Egypt, you see the servants and those who are above them, they're of the same hue. All right? So an Israelite and an Egyptian, it's very hard to distinguish the two. They look the same. And Egyptians from the time of old has always been what you would call black people or an African he has always been. There's no such thing as a white Egyptian or a European. It doesn't exist. Speaking of that, I remember years ago at my job, I was actually having a conversation with a gentleman. He was European. And I asked him, where are you from? He said, I'm from Zimbabwe. I said, what? <laughs> He said, I'm from, I said, look, I said, uh, you may have been born in Zimbabwe, but that's not where you're from. Where are your people from? And then he made plain to me where he was from. Had a similar conversation with a gentleman that was from South Africa, where I work. 
I asked him where he was from. He said, South Africa. I said, okay. I said, you may have been born in South Africa. Where are you from? And then he specifically told me that he was, you know, one of them Afrikaners. You know, several generations ago, they came from Holland or whatever. And now they're down there calling themselves South Africans. So I've dealt with that from the European side. And I had another conversation with a African, a quote unquote black man. And I asked him where he was from. Accent thick as forest, right? I said, man, where are you from? He said, I'm from France. And I'm very direct when I'm dealing with people. I said, uh, okay, man, let's do this again. Where are you from? Because that accent is not from France. <laughs> and then he said he's from Gabon. I've never met a man from Gabon before <clears throat> until I met him. I said, okay. I said, you may be a French citizen. You may speak French. You're not a Frenchman. So when I ask you where you're from, you shouldn't tell me France. You're from Africa. You're from Gabon. And he was embarrassed because I pretty much laid it on him just like that. But our, a lot of our people are not really, we, we are quick to identify with our enemies before we identify with ourselves. Uh, and that is, that is a sickness and part of the confusion of people. Everyone wants to be a part of the winning team whether they are a man of Israel or not. They are identifying with the European powers because they feel there's some benefit in it. So I understand the premise of why I was answered in that manner because many people are looking at Africans or have been taught to look at quote-unquote Africans in a derogatory fashion. So I guess he figured if he told me he was from France, I was going to look at him totally different, differently. And that's just some of the minds of people that's running around here. But you have many that are Europeans that have gone into the lands of Africa, murdered people, stolen their lands, mistreated the people, are unrepentant about their behavior. And they'll actually come out here and tell you, I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm from South Africa. And I'm quick to remind them, no, you're not. And when you remind them of that, they can't stand it. Because they are accustomed to our people playing stupid with them. And when they meet someone that will stand firm and not adhere to the stupidness that they speak, they are embarrassed by it and flabbergasted by it. Same thing with golf. I'm a golfer. So there's something called the Ryder Cup where you have an international team made up of, of many nations, uh, the European team versus America, right? So you have it to where you have these European commentators talking about the Europeans this and the Europeans that, right? And there are people who are stupid enough that goes along with that. Look, man, this is your cousin. This is your uncle. These are your grandfathers and your brothers. You're all of the same bloodline. But they would have you believe that these are Americans and these are Europeans. And this is the language that they use. And these people are wordsmiths with their lies. They will take some nomenclature and will turn it to suit them and will use it against you and give it a totally different meaning. So we have to be careful when dealing with our enemies. For our enemies, their foundation happens to be lies. So we're to remember that at all times when dealing with them. Exodus, once again, we're at Exodus chapter 2, verse 19, and we read where Moses was identified as an Egyptian. Egypt, Misraim, its biblical name, these people are quote-unquote what you would call black people in a modern-day context. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 8 through 11. Genesis chapter 50, verse 8 through 11. <clears throat> All right. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 8 reads 
and on the house of Joseph and his brethren. His brethren are not the people that believe what he believes. His brethren are related to him via bloodline. Those other 11 boys are his brethren. Ain't none of them spiritual Israelite. They're all Israelite by birth. And his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. Verse 9. <clears throat> and there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. We're speaking of Joseph burying his father. Verse 10. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. So he mourned for his father for a week. Verse 11. And the inhabitants of the land, Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atat. They said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mistraim, which is beyond Jordan. Now, Mistraim is the biblical name for the land of Egypt. This is a son of Ham. Once again, Mistraim is one of the sons of Ham. The lands of Ham is Africa. So, Mistraim. They look just like me. Israel, just like me. You can't distinguish the two. The difference is not you. The difference is simply custom and language. That's it. All right? So the Egyptians, the, the Canaanites were like, man, all these Egyptians, they're looking at what are the sons of Jacob, all of them and the Egyptians and there's no distinction between them because they all look the same. They're people of the same hue. Modern day context would be they're the people of the same race. All right. That's to put that in context. We're trying to answer what does Israel look like? Now, let's go ahead and jump to Numbers chapter 12 and we'll read verse 10 through 15. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, and we will read verse 10 through verse 15. All right. Numbers chapter 12, verse 10 reads, And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So the Most High came on the tabernacle, chastised and corrected both of them. And when the Most High left the tabernacle, after correcting both Miriam and Aaron for, say, speaking ill-advised words about Moshe, when the Most High left that situation, she was, she was, she was cursed. She was made leprous, white as snow. Now let's go down here, verse 11. And Aaron said, out to, said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. So it was a great sin for them to speak ill-advised words of Moses. They were pretty much like, you know what? Moses think he's the, he the hottest thing right now in the street. Most high doesn't just speak to him. He speak to us too. We're prophets too. We're this, that, that, that. Why is Moses getting all this shine? That's pretty much their angle. You know, sometimes some of us can be jealous of others, even if it's in your family at times. So they were jealous of Moses getting all this shine. And they figured they'd get together talking about, you know, Moses and Mary, this woman. He's not the only prophet. The Most High speak to us too, etc., etc., etc. So the Most High made her white. So Aaron turned to his brother and said, Look, bro, uh, lay not this upon us. Don't charge us with this. 
please turn our sister back to her normal color, to her normal hue. So what this is telling us in essence is that being white or being pale is not the hue. It is not the appearance of the children of Israel. Now, verse 12. <clears throat> Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's womb. So, I've given the example, if I soak my hands in dish water for about an hour or two and pulled it out, my skin would be white, it would be fleshy, it would be pale, I would look almost sick. And so she had that appearance of just being white and pasty and clearly that was not the look of our people that was not the look of the house of Israel so it was a horrifying thing to see her in that you all right and notice what he said let her not be as one dead that means that's not a normal look to the children of Israel let her not look half consumed that's destroyed okay let her not look like one who's coming out of his mother's womb when you come out your mother's womb you look like you've been soaking in water cause you have so your melanin and your your hue is not what it's supposed to be just yet hope you're getting the understanding here verse 13 and Moses cried unto Yah saying heal her now O Yah I beseech thee alright so, Moses is asking to heal Miriam. That way you understand leprosy is a plague. When you are made white, this is a plague. This is not the look of the children of Israel. And this is why Moshe is stating, asking the Most High to heal her. To return her back to her normal hue. And the most I say, you know what? If her father had spit in her face, she'd be ashamed seven days. So he said, you know what? Get her out of the camp for seven days. And after that, then let her return again. So I'm certain that it doesn't state here. But when she was brought back into that camp, the most high more than likely had restored her color. But while she was hanging around as a white person, she was not even allowed in the camp. Because when you look, when you're white like that, you're leprous. It's a plague. Now, <clears throat> very last place to go Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9. <clears throat> Our last stop Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9. And verse 9 reads, Remember what Yah thy strength did unto Miriam. We just read that. <clears throat> By the way, after that you were come forth out of Egypt. So, the house of Israel, we were told and we were instructed to remember what the Most High did to Miriam. Why are we to remember this? Twofold. One, we are to remember not ever to speak ill of the Most Highest Prophets. That's one. Two, we are to remember that plague, the plague of leprosy, can be placed upon you. We are to remember that anyone that's walking around with this leprosy have highly upset the Most High. And he plagued them. And we are to remember that Moses pleaded. Aaron pleaded with Moses and Moses pleaded with the Most High to return Miriam back to her normal color, which speaks to the fact that the house of Israel does not look like the Israelis. In fact, there is no such thing as an Israeli in this book. And we will address all things pertaining to the Israeli the people that call themselves Jews that sits on the most high's holy land.
What we're going to do with them, we're going to take out this standard. We're going to take out this law. We're going to read it. We're also going to read all the prophecies that the Most High laid out that would befall his people. And then we're going to see exactly if they fit these curses of the Most High's people. We can look at the prophecies that were put forth by the prophets, and we're going to see if the Israelis are fulfilling any of those prophecies. We're going to look at when the people of the Most High return back onto the land. We're going to see if any of those things that the Most High said would take place and be established when we return back to the land. We're going to see if any of those things were established from 1947 to now. And it will be made plain that those people in that land are not the children of Israel. And that's why they can't lay not one brick down on that ground to start that third temple. Can't do it without us. We are the children of Israel. We are the sons and daughters of the living strong one of the earth. We are the sons and daughters of the house of Israel. And they cannot lay a brick to build that third temple. Cannot be done. And we will cover this in part two. So I want to kind of go over 13 questions that will be kind of establish, okay, who is Israel? What are they supposed to do? What happened to them? How can we identify them? That way we lay the groundwork for dealing with our enemies without. That way when someone claims our birthright and claim that they are you, you have no means to contend with them if you don't know who you are. But once you understand who you are, what has happened to you, and you have the documentation via these scrolls, then you could say, no, this pertains unto me. But you're not going to be able to claim that which is rightfully yours unless you first have the documentation by which to set things aright and you do what the document states because you have the document the book of remembrance gives you the guidelines for what you need to claim the prize to get back to your land to be returned back on high and to have all those that kicked you in your teeth to watch them get kicked in the teeth so the road map is right here for us, but we cannot get the prize. We cannot get the glory if we don't follow the road map and do exactly as it states. And that must be for the disciplined. The undisciplined man can't do this law. This law is not impossible. That's why I keep telling you it's important that we teach this word. It's important that we do it. We are showing those around us that this law can be done. There's no way in the earth, there's no way in this whole wide world that the creator of the heavens and the earth is going to give his children some instructions that they cannot follow. That is crazy. So when you hear anyone tell you that, man, the law can't be done, that's why I was done away with, and J.C. came and died on this cross and all this other madness, then you're blaspheming the Most High. You're stating that the Most High is going to pretty much just kill some people that he made and chose for himself because he gave them some instruction that he knew they couldn't follow and he's going to kill them anyway. I don't even know if you understand how blasphemous and crazy that is. But if you're reading this word and you're following it, you certainly do. All right. So that concludes this first part. List them mine enemies, the enemies without. We have laid out the children of Israel, who they are, what has happened to them, and how to identify them. Now, we're going to go in part two, and we're going to see clearly if these people that's claiming to be God's chosen, if when we put this standard up against them, and when we put this, all the prophecies of the Most High and His prophets up against them, we're going to see if any of that holds up in their favor. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Continue to face Jerusalem. Lift your hands in prayer while on your knees. 
Make your supplication cry out unto the Most High from the many nations in which you dwell, that we may be returned back on the land, back onto the land that was promised unto our forefathers, that we be gathered out of these many nations, and that we be that we may be restored, that the Most High standard will be the standard and the one world government throughout the entire earth. That way we no longer have to see the wickedness and the wars and the lies and the propaganda and deal with the heathen and their idols. Peace, Israel, and Yah bless. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is a truth. Part two will be coming up. Peace, Israel, and Yah bless.